Well, I, I think your depiction of, uh, of, his, uh, of your book, Beautiful Country, Burn Again, is absolutely right. And first of all, in terms of how you got to that book, tell us what the title means and, and tell us how you approached it. Um, the title, Beautiful Country, Burn Again, is from a, um, well, what's his name? Poet. <laughs> <laughs> Robinson Jeffers. God, forgive me, please. Um, and I haven't even had any champagne. And, uh, um, and uh, he wrote a, a poem. Uh, God, I can't even remember the title. I'm just not. I mean, my head is in another book. I'm 230 pages into a novel. And so, um, but let me gear back into this. But anyway, it's a, um, it's a poem, a West Coast poem. And the lines go, beautiful country burn again, point Pinos down to the Sur River's burn as before with bitter wonders, fire and ocean and the Carmel waters. But I came across Beautiful Country Burn Again in a piece by Joan Didion. And, and when you do this kind of work, you kind of trust that the titles will come. And I came across that line in her um, book, South by, South by Southwest. And I was like, there's my title, Beautiful Country Burn Again, because we do have a beautiful country. Um, and, uh, and it has burned twice before. And, um, and it sort of feels like we may be on the cusp of a third burning. Um, so anyway, that's the title. And despite the fact that we may be on the cusp of a third burning, you have a great sense of humor. And it comes through in here, but it doesn't start out with a great sense of humor. Well, actually, it sort of does. In the prologue, you write, as you covered the 2016 presidential campaign, 2016 was the year all the crazy parts of America ran amok over the rest. How did you come to that insight? Well, it, it was a crazy year when we came to the end of it, but in the midst of it, I think I, I, I'm not alone in, in having had the thought that, and the feeling that things are really nuts. Um, and it was just every day it seems like two or three or four things would happen where it just felt like the country was off the rails. And, um, and with Trump in particular, I feel like many of us were waiting for the moment where he would go too far, where the laws of political gravity would finally take hold and he would crash and burn, which would have happened when it, with any conventional candidate. And, uh, and the year got crazier and crazier. It, it was a very violent year. And, um, and when I started writing this book, trying to figure out how to like, jam the context into these particular areas I was exploring, um, I came up with this book of days thing where these short chapters in between the main chapters where I'm just like shotgunning all these things that happen in a particular month. Um, to remind myself and hopefully the reader also of, of just how, you know, dizzying and disorienting that world, that, that year was. And dizzying and disorienting, and it's interesting because we all lived through it, but when I read your book, and I know a lot of other people who have read your book, is, well, I didn't quite get it that way. I didn't see that. I didn't notice it, and that's partly because of the juxtapositions you do, but early on in your writing career, you wrote a book about Texas, and I read in the Texas Monthly, you said, and you live in Texas, you said the only way I could approach this is if I viewed and approached Texas as a foreign country that I've never visited before. And you know what, I used to write for Peter Jennings and he used to approach his US stories the very same way because then you notice things that you would have never noticed. Did you approach the American presidential election as if it were a foreign country and, and what did that enable you to see if so? Well, I tried to stay alive and alert to what was going on. And um, I mean, there were a lot of daily journalists who did excellent work that year. I mean, they're down in the trenches. I viewed myself as very much a dilettante or sort of like the fighter pilot who gets to make a few passes and strafing runs you know, over the lines and then I'm back at the base in time for drinks. Um, whereas they're down in the trenches slogging it out every day. So I have a lot of respect. Except I have to interrupt you because I, I don't think you were looking at it necessarily always from up here. 
you immersed yourself, you got embedded, and I, I want you to read one chapter because in order to really appreciate Ben Fountain, you have to read it. You have to read his work. Please read the chapter, and so much has been written about Donald Trump. Like who can give us more insight into Trump and who, who is passionate about Donald Trump without insulting the people who are passionate about him? And I think you just nailed it in this passage. Okay, it's, um, it's on page two of the book. And, um, and so I'm talking about you know, Donald Trump and how all the contradictions and, and flagrancies, is that even a word, flagrancies? Um, it is now. Um, we're just out in plain sight. And, and it, it, it seemed not only not to hurt him, but, but to boost him. And so, um, so this is my riff. How strange that this star and symbol of big city life should become the hero of the heartland. All those millions of wholesome acres of Bible belts that trust the, nation, trust the nation's middle and nether regions. The guy from Sodom and Gomorrah was all right. His insults and earthiness were received as authenticity. Here at last was a man who would stick it to the elites after all these years of eating their crap. The sniffy pieties about tolerance and diversity forced down your throat by the pinheads who'd figured it all out. It was galling. It got you down on yourself. It made you touchy and weak where you, you used to be strong. Then this badass comes along and puts it right out there every time he flaps his mouth. Says all the things you wanted to say all these years as you lived in constant apology just for being who you are. Diminished, depressed, bottled up, pissed off. A hundred fuck yous a day muttered at Obama and his crowd. Heavy weather from Washington all the days of the year. A miracle, the white man who says what he wants. Free, free at last. This may be the most powerful medicine in politics. The leader who delivers a man to his natural self. To be acknowledged as you are, affirmed and blessed from above. One can imagine it as a spiritual experience. A profound burden is lifted. No more doubt, no dark loathings, only the certainty that you are good and on God's side. Ecstasy isn't out of the question. What greater thrill besides sex to be delivered to yourself, liberated from the bad opinion of your enemies? Something of that ecstasy could be heard at Trump's rallies. Build that wall and lock her up, bellowed like Romans watching lions sink their teeth into Christian flesh. He tells it like it is. How often we heard him praised in those terms. He says what a lot of people are thinking. Apparently so. Many more than were willing to admit it to the pollsters. And, and this gets, and you don't have the word race in there, but there is a lot of thought put into the race issue in America. And you know, you're, the way you capture that, you say the most reliable play in, in the American power grab book is racism. Tell us what you mean by that and how did you see it on the campaign trail? All right, well this is the year 2019. And white supremacy began in America exactly 400 years ago this year. In 1619, the first consignment of human beings held in bondage arrived at Jamestown. 20 and something, 20 and, 20 and odd something Negroes. That was the bill of lading, the invoice, the, the, the shipping manifest. And, um, and so slavery, racism, white supremacy, you know, they were there at the very beginning. Jamestown was founded in 1607 the first permanent settlement in the US. 12 years later, the first humans in bondage arrive, and so it's been with us ever since. Um, it's in our DNA, our collective DNA. Um, I mean, Trump spoke a very powerful truth in the course of his campaign, and that was the working people of this country have gotten the shaft the last 35 or 40 years. And I mean, the numbers show it, the anecdotal evidence shows it, um, the numbers on economics, on maternal mortality, on, on, on social mobility, all the numbers show it. And Trump spoke that truth directly, and it was a powerful truth. He coupled that 
you know, with the ugliest sort of, you know, racist dog whistles, and at times not even dog whistles, just very blatant. And, um, and the country was, was at a point that, that those two things proved to be a winning combination. And uh, you also talk about the lack of opportunity, whether it be race-based or not. And I think you, you've got a quote in here, uh, which I, I just want to grab because it really nailed it for me. Uh, the pursuit of happiness, so many forced to run that race on their knees. Yeah, I'm speaking specifically about people of color in that passage. Um, I mean, emancipation was an extraordinary moment in American history. Um, four million people, at least on paper, became citizens. Um, but in terms of fulfilling those words in the Declaration, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which are foundational words, those are the aspirations of the country, um, I mean, we all know from even a cursory reading of history that people of color were still, you know, very much disadvantaged in, in having any degree of autonomy, self-determination in the pursuit of happiness. Hence, they're running that race on their knees. So I want to, I want to take a step back just to introduce uh, people to your story because as I was researching you, Malcolm Gladwell did a piece, I don't know if anybody's read that piece, using you as a case study in the late bloomer. <laughs> and, and, Why is everybody laughing? <laughs> and based, based on this piece, you bloomed about 10 years ago. So tell us, tell us. How am I looking? <laughs> Tell us about that journey. Well, late bloomer is a nice way of saying slow learner. Um, I mean, I quit practicing, I practiced law five years, quit in 1988, and, um, and wandered in the wilderness for many years, um, trying to figure out how to write, um, trying, failing, trying again. Um, I was a house husband during those years, so I was running the house, taking care of the kids, um, my wonderful wife, Sharon, was practicing law, otherwise we would have all died. Um, and uh, it took me 10 years to write a short story that pleased me. I mean, I, I was publishing a few stories here and there in small magazines, but, um, but it took 10 years to write a story where I could go back to it after six months and say, hey, okay, this is all right. Um, I mean, small, small steps, halting steps. Um, I have a lecture I give sometime. The title is How to Get a Book Contract in Only 17 Years. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's my sad story. So as a, are you a very religious man? Is it that you had faith that would all work out? Well, it was more like I'm all in, and, and I had to be all in if I was ever going to do any kind of worthwhile work. Like, I did not have a backup plan. I was not going to go back to practicing law, um, and so it was this or nothing. And at a certain point, I got pretty zen about it. It was, all right, I'm going to take pleasure in the work itself and seeing myself get stronger you know, over time. Um, it is an exploration, um, and, uh, and I'm working at an art, and I'll take pleasure in that. And if I never have any worldly success to speak of, can I live with that? And I decided, yeah, I can live with that. I'll just live my little life here in North Dallas and, and be the dad who's a bum, you know, and. Uh, and, you know, who says he's writing, but, you know, nobody ever's really writing. And, and, and by the way, and you didn't have a linear plan, because as I read it, and you've got to tell us, when we were talking last night, you said, you know, your next book is a novel. And by the way, I want to try to steer you away today from the novel and bring you back to, I want your next book to be on the 2020 election. Can we draft you? Because I think we need you to cover that. 
but, but nevertheless, uh, Haiti, you said your next novel's on Haiti. I'm thinking, oh my God, why do we need to hear about Haiti now when we need you for the election? Well, you know, I, I started going to Haiti in 1991. Um, just out of instinct and intuition, I felt like I needed to go to a very hard place with a much different reality from the white middle class reality I'd grown up in and lived in my whole life. Um, and so in 2016, Haiti was having a presidential election alongside ours, and I pitched a story to The Guardian. Let me go to Haiti, and I'll do a piece comparing their election with ours, their politics with ours, and which country has the most dysfunctional politics. <laughs> and, um, and it wasn't in the travel budget, so we didn't do it, but... Um, but anyway, it's, it's uh, I mean. But it, but it sounds like when you left for Haiti on that very first time, which was how many years ago? 1991. You hadn't published anything yet. And you're I'd published a couple of small stories. And you're going off to Haiti for what purpose? I had a notion for a novel, which, um, uh, I mean, it's totally ridiculous. I mean, why would I go, why would I set a novel in Haiti? But when you do this kind of work, I mean, you learn, to an extent, to a large extent, you've got to follow your instincts and intuition. And sometimes they will re lead you down the wrong path. Um, but maybe that's, in a weird way, necessary. Um, but, uh, you know, I've always been interested in politics and power and economics and race and just, you know, the big forces and, and how they tend to grind up ordinary people. And I felt like Haiti was a laboratory for that. I mean so many of the layers are stripped away and you can see the process in, in brutally frank um, form. And so I thought, okay, I'll go to Haiti and, and maybe I'll learn some things. And is there anything you brought back from Haiti that, that really informed the way you see what's going on in America? Yeah, I mean, Haiti radicalized me. Um, one of my first trips, uh, the fellow who was guiding me around, who, who became a fast friend and, and was one of the best people I've ever known in my life. We were in a bookstore, because I'm a book nerd, I said, take me to the bookstore. And, um, and there was a biography of, of Fidel Castro sitting on the table with you know the big picture of Fidel, and he pointed to it and said, that's a good guy. And, and you know, I'd, I'd had 34 years of American indoctrination, and I was like, Hey, you know, Fidel's a monster, you know, he's terrible. And, um, but when you look at it from the Haitian point of view, right, Fidel took power in 59, Duvalier took power in 57. Duvalier became, for the most part, a fast friend of the United States. Um, Fidel, obviously, you know, it turned out differently. Um, you look at the difference between Haiti and Cuba, Cuba, everybody has health care, everybody has education. Um, it's a tough place to live, but you have those two things. In Haiti, the economics are worse. I mean, there's no public education. Health, the health care system is non-existent. And so you, you contrast those two places, and you can see how a Haitian man would, would look at Fidel and say, yeah, he did a lot for his people. You, the, um, you talk about, I want to get back to the 2020 election, looking ahead, because I really think you have an invaluable perspective. And, you know, you went from primary to primary. Some of the material you write about Iowa is really fascinating. And it's, again, it's not insulting, but it really tells you, this, this is what you're not seeing on the television or reading about. And you sort of talk about the Iowa stink. So I want to bring it back to America and just... Tell us what you experienced in Iowa, because Iowa is just around the corner. Well, I mean, in this book, I'm trying to give the reader an experience, like I had an experience. And, um, and I feel like when books are working, if they're rising to the level of literature, and by literature I don't mean you know fancy writing by people in ascots and turtlenecks, but writing that's really get, getting down into the real stuff of life. Um, you know, all the confusion and complexity and, and, and 
contingency. And, and so I thought if this book is gonna be any good, worth anything, I've got to make it an experience for the reader as opposed to information. I think experiences are what change us, not so much information. So to illustrate that, I just, I just pulled up two passages that I'd love you to read. They're very brief passages in Iowa. And it's here and then the next page, right. just to highlight it. Okay. All right, so we're in Iowa. It's a beautiful country pretty much heartbreaking in the golden afternoon light, and as reported by Richard Manning and Harper's, highly toxic. Massive concentrations of nitrates from chemical fertilizers in the shit of some 21 million Iowa hogs and 52 million Iowa chickens, most of them housed in animal factories, have rendered much of the state's drinking water unfit for human consumption. All right, so, <clears throat> So, you know, I'm rolling through the Iowa landscape. It's so beautiful. All right. With Manning's report in mind, the pleasure one gets from the beauties of the Iowa landscape is distinctly conflicted. And when you add the olfactory sense, the fact is Iowa stinks. Literally, pervasively, far and wide and end to end. I grew up in the sticks, North Carolina, and know from farm smells, but Iowa is of a different order altogether. Its stench goes well beyond the localized funk of the barnyard, the ammoniac reek of summer shit in the stable and pen. Iowa is skunky like a pulp mill is skunky, like the sediment tanks of a big city sewage treatment plant. God, I'm really rough on Iowa, aren't I? <laughs> so, it, it takes industrial scale effort to create cosmic stinks like this. People of Iowa, I apologize. No offense intended. <laughs> You know, you, you, get, you get so into that, and, and I, almost, I almost feel like you understand from the inside. I mean, you've clearly embedded yourself in these places, and go, moving ahead to how we can sort of save our country from burning again. And, and that's where I don't know how much thought you've given to it. You've documented what the risks are, but you write uh, early on, uh, so this book may be read as the record of a developing crisis, one drastic enough to raise the possibility of a third reinvention. One wonders what manner of burning awaits us in this time of Trump. And now we've had a couple of years to see it. And again, this is a, on a nonpartisan basis. Um, and so, uh, by, and by the way, those first two burnings, just to be clear for people, the Civil War was the first one, Lincoln came in and saved us, the Great Depression was the second one. And so we might be on the verge of this third burning. So it makes me think, there's a guy, William Urey, who wrote the book Getting to Yes. He's one of the great conflict resolution negotiators. And I interviewed him uh, in, from Columbia after this Columbia peace deal was signed just recently with the FARC guerrillas. And I know you have a short story about a FARC guerrilla, or a, a, a yeah, member of FARC. And so he told me that one of the ways they figured out how to create peace with their sworn enemy, the government, and he advised them on this, he brought in the president's brother, and he said, you're an advisor here, we need you to write the victory speech that the guerrilla's leaders will deliver to their people in the jungle, and then you need to decide how much can the government give up without violating its critical interests in order to help that FARC commander give the victory speech? Otherwise, there will be no peace. From that first passage you read and everything else I'm reading here, you have a deep understanding of all the sides in this conflagration. Can you think of, of a speech or an opening line of a speech that the supporters of say a Donald Trump might be given and feel like there is a victory here even if we lose an election? Well, that's a great um, way to frame this whole issue. Let me just say that um, those first two burnings, the Civil War and Emancipation and the Great Depression and the New Deal were not triumphs of consensus politics. I mean, the civil war, the emancipation of people held in bondage, I mean, 
It was the result of the bloodiest war in, in the country's history. I mean, we had tried consensus politics. That was the great compromise of 1850, and then another compromise in 1854. And those were not just moral failures, but political failures. And so by 1865, no one would call that result consensus. Um, it, it, emancipation was rammed down the South's throat, as it damn well should have been. The New Deal, I mean, the Great Depression, it was a real crisis in the country. And, and, and I think we don't appreciate just how close the country came to burning. Um, by, by the fall of 1932, there were parts of the country that were in open insurrection against local authority. Something like a quarter of the farmland in Mississippi had been foreclosed on. And in Nebraska, Iowa, Mississippi, farmers were banding together to, to you know, block local authority from foreclosing on farmers. Um, The New Deal, I mean, Franklin Roosevelt won in 1932 in a landslide and brought with him a, a heavily Democratic Congress. And so, and then 1934 and 1936, I mean, his hand was strengthened by the electoral result. The New Deal was not a triumph of consensus politics. It was a politics that flattened the opposition and an opposition which deserved to be flattened. The country had to be remade if it was going to continue as an arguably authentic constitutional democracy. And the opposition was so flattened that for the next 40 years, the center of American politics was in a much different place than it had been prior to 1932. And it wasn't until the election of Reagan that the opposition you know, started to get real pushback against the society that the New Deal had created. So, I mean, when I listen to Howard Schultz um, and other prophets of consensus and getting to yes, I mean, I want to get to yes. I do not want the country to burn. Those are dangerous situations and volatile situations. And you, I mean, there are too many variables. You don't know what's gonna happen. Um, but I really wonder how we're going to get to yes at this point short of having to go through some kind of existential crisis. Um, I mean, you know, that was a great technique um, which this gentleman who, you know, advised the Colombian government, um, you know. And so the FARC and the government did reach an agreement which was rejected by the people in a vote. And so, all right, well, okay, we got to yes, but we didn't. And, um, and so I, I just, um, I mean, we can talk more about this, but I think it's going to be very tough at this point in our politics to, to create a new consensus um, short of an existential crisis. It's interesting because I'm interviewing Sylvia Earle, the great oceanographer and deep sea explorer later today, and uh, a lot of people feel that this, it's the same issue with the climate and our environment, that it, we must see the existential crisis before we act. Uh, I'm, I want to turn it over to the audience for questions, but you did mention one quick line, is that you're just a boy from the sticks. Does that, uh, does that give you an advantage somehow? Well, it is who I am. I mean... Um, what, was, what, what do you mean by coming from the sticks? Well, I grew up in a couple of small towns in North Carolina, in eastern North Carolina, tobacco country, and, um, and my maternal grandfather was a tobacco farmer, so I spent summers down on the farm, um, uh, which I loved. Um, I wanted to be a farmer for a long time, but um, I don't know, uh, just, um, I mean, that's who I am. I, I have a different background than someone who grew up in New York, and um, it's, uh, I mean, most of my family voted for Trump, and they are well-educated, prosperous people, um, people with good hearts, and, uh, and so why did they vote for Donald Trump when they can see, you know, they would admit, yeah, he's a charlatan, he's a con man, he's a hustler, but, and it's in that but that the whole world pivots. You know, it's interesting because one of our volunteers here, Kathleen in the back, uh, who I think works at the library, 
right before we started, she said, you know, I love the chapter, your chapter on the history of the phony. And it was somebody you talked about in Texas where you live. Do you want to just give us a thumbnail and then I'll turn it over to questions? Yeah, there's, um, there's a chapter in the book called The Phony in American Politics, and, and it's basically about, you know, our tradition of con, con men and occasionally con women who bamboozle us and flimflam us. And, I mean, we are amazingly susceptible to, the, to these characters. And, um, and so I go into, a, you know, like the sub-presidential level is where you really find the colorful, um, the colorful con artists like um, Papio O'Daniel, uh, in Texas, he rode high for six or seven years. He was a flower salesman, and he had a radio show. Um, and, uh, and he was the first media celebrity in the Southwest, and he used that to, as, a, as a springboard for his political career. Um, and Joe McCarthy, you know, the, the famous Republican senator from Wisconsin, he rode high for five or six years. And, and these individuals are, they, they are just patently full of it. And yet, you know, there is something in us, something in us we want to believe, and so we fall for it over and over again. And I think I only mentioned Trump once in that piece, but um, I'm hoping by virtue of restraint, you know, that the reader will make this very short leap, you know, step, hop from, you know, Joe McCarthy and Pappy O'Daniel to to certain figures in our own time. Well, a great Hollywood producer once says, oh, it's okay to be subtle as long as you're obvious about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why, don't we, why don't we open it up to questions? Does anybody have questions for Ben Fountain? Yes. Is there a microphone uh, for the... I'll, re I'll repeat the question, how about that? Yeah, is, is the current, you know, crisis in institutions and, and the traditional order, say the post-World War II order, um, is it similar to previous burnings? Yeah, similar in this respect that ordinary people have gotten the shaft for the last 35 or 40 years. They're starting to figure it out by virtue of experience. Um, it's harder and harder for people to make it, get ahead, provide basic things for their families. Um, and also, the political process, the institutions, they haven't allowed for change. And um, not enough change. And so, certainly for, you know, slaves in the United States prior to 1865, the political process, the institutions were not serving their needs by any you know, stretch of the imagination. Um, and by 1932, the political processes to that point um, had proved so unresponsive to people that they voted overwhelmingly for a new regime. And, and what was overtly offered as a new regime, you know, Franklin Roosevelt said, we have to go in a different direction. Um, so, you know, we get to this point in our politics, 2016, and the political process, you know, and we could talk about this for a week, you know, has become calcified and stunted and, and so obstructed by um, entrenched powers that it hasn't mattered much who the people vote for, Republican or Democrat. I think, you know, the Democrats are the party where things get worse a little more slowly for working people. Um, but they don't really get, you know, significantly better. And people get frustrated. The institutions aren't working for them. They aren't seeing change. They're falling farther and farther behind. And so, of course, they're going to lash out. And, um, and we're seeing that all over, all over the Western world. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, 
Yeah, um, being a slow learner, um, how did I get better to the extent I got better? How did it happen? I don't know. I mean, it, the only way it happened was by doing it. And, um, and so those first few years were really painful years where, because I hated everything I wrote. Um, and, you know, I had these fantasies of, okay, I'm going to go off and, like, do something to make money. And while I'm doing that, like, whatever thing has to happen to my brain will be happening, and when I come back to it, I can really write. Um, which, you know, was a fantasy. I mean, the only way I was going to get better was sitting down every day and trying to get the words on the page. And, um, and slowly I could see myself getting better. Um, you know, very slowly. But it was only through getting up and doing the work every day you know, as a discipline um, that I could make any headway. And, uh, and so, you know, the only thing I can say is to the extent I got better, it was only by doing it that I got better. It, you had a routine, at least when you started. Is it the same routine? I mean, you want to describe what your yeah, lighting routine yeah, is? Yeah, pretty much. Um, you know, get up, get the kids breakfast, get them off to school, uh, then sit down at the desk, work till lunch, eat lunch, lie down on the floor for 20 minutes, um, <laughs> clear my head, get up, and work till it's time to get the kids from school. And so... That's still pretty much it, so although you, the kids are grown. And you literally lie on, lie on the floor for 20 minutes. Yeah, beside the desk. <laughs> I don't, um, sometimes I actually you know, lie down in a bed, but I don't know, it just feels right to lie down on the floor by the desk, not to get too far away from it. Right. That's a very... I mean, I wear my underwear sometimes, you know, when I'm right, if we really want to get down into the nitty gritty. Wow. Before you said that, the images I couldn't get out of my head were in the book. But now I, <laughs> yes. Yeah, um, Joe McCarthy, Trump, and, and the connective tissue there being Roy Cohn. The, the infamous New York City lawyer who was McCarthy's, you know, chief counsel um, through, you know, so many investigations and hearings in the early 50s. Roy Cohn was a piece of work. Um, and, uh, and he was a young man with Joe McCarthy, an older man, you know, when Trump came along. And, and Trump learned, you know, as Trump says, I learned a lot from, from Roy Cohn. Like, when they punch, you punch back twice as hard. And um, I mean, Roy Cohn was a stinker. That's all there is to it. I mean, he was, he was if not amoral, immoral. He lied, he cheated, he stole. Um, and uh, I mean, it, you know, I mean, sometimes you just gotta say it is what it is. And, um, and so the fact that Trump and McCarthy have this, this gentleman in common I mean, you know, we need to pay attention. We need to look, like be alive and alert to what the hell is going on. And, um, you know, anybody who has Roy Cohn for their longtime personal lawyer, I you know, just de facto, from the very beginning, I would say this person is highly suspect. I hope there's no rel relatives of <laughs> Roy Cohn here. I think, yes. Um, a lot of the book was written as, as the campaign was unfolding. I was doing these pieces for The Guardian. And, um, and so then when we got the result that we did, I thought, okay, I, I need to go deeper um, because I, there's so much I don't understand. Like, why did we get this result? And so those pieces for The Guardian, like they were the starting point. And, um, and most of those got heavily revised because I needed to go deeper. And, um, and then probably 60 to 70% of the book is new. And I was writing the book from the perspective of 2016, but not pretending like my consciousness stopped 
at the end of 2016. I mean, um, yeah, I'm allowing for, you know, what was going on as I was writing the book, but the book is very much grounded in 2016. Yes. Do I intend to write about 2020? Well, I've started. I had a piece in the New York Review of Books come out last month about um, Howard Schultz and, and Michael Bloomberg, the billionaires who, you know, with presidential aspirations and, and how they advertise themselves as, as centrists, you know, advocating a centrist politics, um, which I argue is really a politics of the status quo as opposed to a true centrist politics. Um, I mean, I really want to work on this novel. Um, <laughs> and I don't feel like it's irrelevant. I mean, it's a pretty political novel um, set in Haiti, but I'm, I'm really fascinated by what's going on in the country. And just from my own head, my own sense of peace, I want to try to figure it out, out as much as I can. And so, you know, people, People ask me to write, and I have a hard time saying no. You know, they ask me to write about politics. So I expect that, you know, I will be writing as it unfolds. But I have to say, you must be good at saying no, because clearly you have a lot of people who want you to do something else. <laughs> yeah, and I want to do something, that something else too. I mean, I want to do it all. And I mean, I'm, I'm a slow learner, and so there's, <laughs> There's only so much I could do. I mean, I really wish I was one of these geniuses who can just, you know, put out a book every two years and be doing all these other things. But um, it takes me a while to figure things out. Can I end on, I want to end on just an optimistic note right from your book here. It's just a small moment where you were talking about a specific campaign rally and there was all this music and, and you said, you know, this, uh, all these threads of musical tradition are a happy thing to see. They do, as all true culture does, encourage one's humanity. Maybe there's something there that points us down the road. I think there are a lot of reasons to be hopeful, and, and a big reason is the sheer variedness of American culture. I mean, anybody or any force who tries to shoehorn the vastness of America and all the variety of America into one channel, I mean, good luck, because we are unruly and variable and, and, and you know, diverse and, um, and uh, stubborn. And uh, so I think our, our sheer variety and hard-headedness and joy in the various cultures we have made here, you know, that come from various places, that may be our saving grace. All right.